All right, so welcome back to another one of APSA's interactive sessions for the 2022-2023 academic year. Uh, we're pleased to be hosting tonight's session with current physician scientist trainees answering questions regarding post-baccalaureate programs and gap years. And just as a reminder, tonight's webinar is a part of an ongoing supporting applicant webinar series. And we encourage all of you in attendance tonight to be on the lookout for registration for our next session, which will be a um, <laughs> which will be about gap years and post programs on December 8th. I don't believe that's correct, but that's all right. Um, okay, I'd now like to have our wonderful panelists go around and introduce themselves, including uh, your current institutions and your role. So to be efficient, I'll call on you by name. If we could start with Molly Marr. Hi everyone, Molly Marr. I'm at Oregon Health and Science University and I'm currently a fourth year medical student. Okay, and Daniel Sai. Hi everyone, my name is Daniel Sai. I'm a wee little first year medical student at the University of Miami. And Nipun Cottage. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Nipun Kodage. I am a third year in the MD PhD, first year PhD in anthropology. And then Kelly Abshire. So uh, my name is Kelly Abshire. I'm a second year med medical student at Oregon Health and Science. Okay, thank you everyone. And to the panelists, thank you all for being here. And um, we're grateful that you took the time out of your day to virtually attend our meeting. We know this is a very hectic time of the year for everyone. Um, so your engagement is utmostly appreciated. In this session, we hope to provide you with information to help inform your post undergraduate decisions. My name is Eva Vogt, and I'll be your moderator for the evening. I'm a second year undergraduate student at Lafayette College in PA, so even we, we literal, littler than Daniel. And in the chat box, also helping us tonight will be Min Pham. And for those of you who are going to step away or miss a piece of this recording, as a reminder, we'll have it recorded. So um, as a reminder, I will uh, ask you to please submit your questions to the Q&A box. Um, we have a team of co-moderators behind the scenes collecting questions live. You can submit the questions in the chat box. I think that's all the announcements I have. Thank you again for all being here, and I'm going to go ahead and start with our first question. So what do you suggest to be the best ways to spend a gap year before applying to med school? Um, if Daniel, could you start us off? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's helpful that the people I, I presume who are attending this meeting are interested in pursuing a physician scientist track, because in that case, I think the answer is research. I guess to take a step back, I graduated from Duke in 2021 and um, the mentorship that I received from my advisors there. And this is just kind of general medical school applicant was to do the thing that you're worst at to try and, and strengthen your weakness. So for me, actually, I was told I didn't have much clinical experience. So on paper, my advisor told me, oh, you should go be a scribe, go be a, a tech, do something in the hospital to boost clinical experience. But then I told her that, hey, actually, I'm really interested in pursuing a physician scientist position and MSTP programs and MD-PhD programs. And that changed things. And then I ended up pursuing research. I was a post -back, um fellow at the NIH. And that was a really rewarding experience. And that I think took me a really long way in terms of applying and even now just the research experience and being able to talk about a, an independent project that I truly did lead on my own like outside of undergrad is is huge. Thank you so much and I think a good segue from that is talking about um, alternatives to post -backs. So um, Molly do you know of any alternatives to the post baccalaureate programs? I had to do one because I was a theater major undergraduate. So I am I am going to punt this to someone else who might have ideas. Oh yes, please. Uh, I'll I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't know anyone. Jump in. I have no idea what a good response is here. I guess it's fresh in my mind. Oh, or Kelly. Sorry. <laughs> Well, I have, um, so I took three years off after undergrad and I did the first year as just a research technician in a lab. And then I also joined the NIH as part of their post -back program. So I've seen a little bit of both sides. And I think that you, like either one, 
works at the end of the day. It's almost dependent more on the PI and how much one, they allow you to do and allow you to suggest and kind of take leadership over your own projects and as well as your own um, impetus to want to kind of do your own thing and suggest and put your work out there. So you can do a more just traditional research technician, research assistant job. It's, it's sort of what you make of it. All right, thank you so much. Um, and then something that you might be more apt to respond to Molly. Um, so what, uh, where did you apply for your gap year opportunities? So as I said before, I really was changing from one undergraduate major to another. And so I looked for programs that um, and I think this could be helpful. I'm a low income applicant, and so I couldn't pay out of pocket. So I looked at universities and colleges that had a pre med program and job opportunities. So I actually worked at a school of law in order to get tuition remission so that I could didn't have to pay out of pocket for the post back classes. And a lot of a lot of colleges will have that opportunity available. So look for pre med classes, and then just go to their job board and figure out what you might be able to apply into. The downside for that is you are working full time and it was really problematic because my professors didn't have office hours during evening hours, which made it really difficult uh, for me to be able to attend the office hours as needed. So I ultimately ended up switching to Hunter College in New York City, which offered evening classes and evening office hours and then took on extra jobs to pay out of pocket. All right, thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Nippon, uh, so what types of experiences did you look for when you had um, your gap year? Thanks, Ava. That's a great question. And so great to hear from all the other panelists. Um, I think that kind of echoing what I've heard from the other panelists, like people do postbacs and gap years for different reasons. And I think like a lot of MD folks might have come in from like a non-STEM background and they'll do a postbac to be prepped for med school. Um, and on the physician sciences training program, a lot of folks do. Um, like ERTA fellowships at the NIH. Um, and so for me, I was, I graduated from University of Maryland in 2019 and I was looking for honestly some space to like do my research and to like apply at the same time. And so I applied to a bunch of like global like fellows, like kind of NGO jobs and didn't get any of them. And so I worked with uh, a professor in criminology at Maryland who had been working with before. Um, and so it was continuing. He got me a paid position that was working on understanding the causes of consequences of gun violence in DC. And so in that role, I was kind of continuing a lot of the projects I had started in undergrad, but in more of like a, a manuscript and like kind of wrapping up research and like publishing it, uh, which was really nice because it gave me some flexibility for the actual like application process, which was pretty taxing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, speaking about application processes, I know, Kelly, you just recently spoke about how you had three gap years in between. And I was wondering, um, what did preparing for the MCAT and med application look like after doing undergraduate and during your post -bac? Um, uh, I think it was actually probably a little bit easier than an undergraduate, actually. I took the MCAT twice. Once was um, the summer before my senior year of undergrad, and then another one while I was working. And I actually think that having a more structured schedule with a nine to five job helped me also uh, build a structured schedule for my study routine for the MCAT, and also maybe the maturity that also comes with just being a year out of college um helps but it's you would definitely have to add in some extra hours of the day um but as long as you have a boss that is willing to work with you and was very forgiving of my i'm gonna take a day off or like can we take a break from talking about research and can you please edit my personal statement um it's all about being communicative of your needs without letting i guess your work also slip in the background Awesome, thank you. And uh, did you want to add to this? Absolutely. I just wanted to reiterate how important having a boss whose expectations aligns with your career ambitions are. I think I have a, my partner was at post back at the NIH, and I think her boss 
wasn't exactly aligned with that. And so that can be a real struggle and create a lot of conflict. And so when you have any opportunities to have conversations about when you can be more present at your job and when you need time for applications or interviews, I think that kind of communication goes a long way. Thank you. And then um, back to Daniel, I know you spoke also about uh, being doing your post back at the NIH, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so uh, what made you choose your particular program? Well, I knew that I was very interested in, in cancer immunology. Uh, that's what I'm still interested in. So that's kind of where uh, my search started for PIs. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the NIH um, post back program, the IRTA program, it's it's actually a very simplistic process. You fill out an application, so to speak, but there's no centralized committee looking at them and screening through them. You actually just kind of fill it out. It goes into a bank, and then you you yourself reach out, almost cold call um, PIs to come look at you, or they reach out to you if they saw your application. So you actually have really autonomy over who you're interested in. And I was mainly looking at um, labs who were doing cancer immunotherapy or cancer epigenetics. Um, I had a few options because um, everyone likes post -backs, everyone likes the cheap labor. Um, but I ended up picking the one actually um, that which was just mentioned that was the most flexible and the most understanding of I'm applying to school because I only took a year off. So truthfully, my gap year was also my application years. And she, we went into it with her understanding that I was going to leave for interviews and I was going to have to take time away. So I prioritized the mentor over anything else. Thank you. Um, and uh, Molly, I know you just spoke about being a theater major uh, for your undergraduate. So how do you recommend exploring a broad range of interests or subject areas during your gap years? So for my gap years, I was switching to show the focus on medicine. So I, I really sort of transitioned. I was volunteering on the weekends um, in the emergency department. I was doing the pre-medical coursework I needed to do evenings. I was working a full-time job and to really sort of build the research aspect, I started working full-time as a research coordinator in clinical medicine and then sort of, or a research assistant, and then moved up to coordinator or program manager and sort of built on the research experience that way. Yeah, wow, that's amazing, first off. Oh my goodness. Um, <clears throat> okay, and then uh, I want to move on to some unique or specific cases for the questions. So if any panelist is able to uh, provide any insight for these questions, please feel free to either raise your hand or unmute. Um, so it says, what advice do you have for non-traditional applicants? Um, we have a take me for example, I'm a 33 year old PhD preparing to take the MCAT. What specifically do they want advice on? Um, that is a great question. I. It's unfortunately not more specified, but um, Molly, if you'd like to. Well, I, I'm not, again, I'm sort of inferring. I, I applied to medical school in my mid to late, in, like early to mid thirties. And so you're, you will get questions on, you know, they're not, it's illegal to ask about age. I, the questions for me were couched in ways like as a non-traditional applicant, how do you see yourself getting along with peers a decade younger? That's a question about age, right? But it has been couched in a way where people feel as though it's okay to ask. Those questions are gonna come up. They will come up for the rest of your career because people wanna know how you're gonna fit in their community, especially if you took, I took nine years off. Uh, so I was coming in older than my peers. And I would say, just be prepared for those questions. I think people are excited. If you can explain, especially the transition, the pivot point and the why, that'll be really critical. If you're if you're coming in with that PhD or if you're coming in with that different career, know your why. Awesome, thank you so much. Does anyone else have anything to add to this before we move on? No, all right. Um, we also had a question about um, what you think doing a Caribbean medical school versus getting your master's and then applying into medical school. Um, I'm 
it doesn't specify the context of this question, but I think it's surrounding like uh, doing applications um, and looking at your com how competitive you appear. Molly, go for it. I can kick this one off at least. Um, Be, you, when you get to fourth year of medical school and you're for residencies, you will have a little bit of a harder time as a Caribbean applicant. You will also have a harder time getting clerkships and rotations as a third year and a fourth year medical student. So it isn't as easy a path as it looks like when you're a first and a second year medical student. Um, the other piece is the cost is substantial. There are differences in financial aid. There are differences in the loans you can apply for. There are, you are paying for so many aspects of that education out of pocket and your loan options are limited. So know that going in as well. You don't necessarily have to get a master's. There are po many post bac programs that have educational enrichment opportunities where you can do some classes to increase that GPA. A lot of programs just want to know that you can do some graduate work without necessarily needing a full master's. So I would say look at all of the different opportunities if you're trying to use it for that, if you're thinking about the master's for that educational boost. I could hop into, I think that like one of I think there's like a lot of reasons why an applicant would be interested in exploring that path. And for me, I just reflect back on like what made me successful in my application process. And like part of it was that my like undergrad university, like University of Maryland had a very strong health professions like advising office. And I know that's not evenly distributed. And so I think that if that's a path that you're pursuing because you're um, concerned about like your competitiveness, either in like stats or experiences, I would maybe perhaps through this organization, find ways to reach out to mentors and like think through what our way, like what is put like moving you in that direction and see if there's ways to um, maybe even get opportunities through like work. Like Molly mentioned, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a master's to be qualified to go to med school. You can do um, like research jobs or other clinical jobs to give you that exposure. Yeah, thank you so much. I love that insight, especially because it sets me up perfectly for my next question, which is frequently asked, but it's how do you find a good mentor and what questions do you ask or what do you look for in a lab? So um, I would like to hear from Kelly and then we'll go from there. Um, I would say, can you one, just like have a nice rapport with them? Do you get along with them? Um, for, I, I think I've had a couple really substantial mentors that have gotten me to where I was today. Um, the one I had at the NIH, who I think I have a lot of thanks for, again, getting me into an MD-PhD, was I sought him out initially because he was an MD-PhD. So he knew exactly what the program entailed and what um, the expectations were going to be for me and was also open to working with me going through this application process. So I think it's be very open in your communication from the get go. Um, and don't be afraid to interview them as you are, as they are interviewing you, ask them what their expectations are of you. Um, like ask them, yeah, just ask them all the questions. And um, that's, that's, I think my best advice. All right, thank you. Um, but I feel like this is a great question. So does anyone else wanna hop on board? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I touched on it a bit um, a couple of questions ago, but I, I think Kelly put it well in that it, it's it's a matter of clarifying expectations and and clarifying what you hope to get out of the relationship. So for a lot of us, if it's a, a post back program, because that's what, what keeps coming up, um, a mentor for a post back program, the, the expectation, the project is, is important, don't get me wrong, but the expectation is to get into school. And what you need from the mentor to do that can be very different between people. Some people kind of want a hands off, just let me do my project. Let me take time off and apply and do all that stuff. But hands off, whereas other people, hey, I want you to read my personal statement. I want you to write me a rec letter at some point. Maybe we'll not, you know, I wouldn't say that off you know, <laughs> up front, but clarifying how involved you want them to be in the post back program and in your application process, I think is really important when applying. And once you get into a program and you want to pick a mentor for a PhD, that's like a whole nother story. But 
in the immediate future for a lot of applicants, it's what can they provide you? What can you provide them? And hopefully it matches. Awesome. And so from that Q&A box, I actually have oh, a question. Do, oh, do you mind sorry, if I hop in there? Yeah. yeah. I, I think this like good mentors are like make or break, especially for an MD PhD application, because like um, you have your personal statement, you have your experiences, but like so much comes out of your letters and the ways that people like vouch for you. Um, and some caveats on that is that I'm a social science MD PhD. And I think for any physician scientist in general, like it's kind of hard to find MD PhD mentors. And so you kind of don't necessarily need to have a mentor who's like exactly the fit for your interest, but you should have someone that like emulates at least a part of your interest, whether that's your research interest or clinical. Um, and then like any other relationships, it's like red flags and green flags. So green flags might be like creating opportunities for you, being interested in what your like goals are, what you want to get out of it. Um, and why opportunities, I mean, like not just we'll get you a paper by the end of the summer, but like probably what's more important is taking intellectual like ownership over a project, being able to like do the planning and design and have support. Um, I think like red flags, I have a good friend who was um, at like a major research institution and they worked in this lab for like three years and their mentor said, I won't write you a letter of rec for your application until you finish this paper. And this was like pulled in, like this drew dragged on to like July of their application year. And then they wrote a bad letter and they got into a great institution, but it was in spite of the mentor. So um, I only say that just to like be, um, not to put people on defensive, but just to be conscious and be aware of the types of relationships that you're cultivating. Thank you so much. Um, and then so from the Q&A chat box, um, we actually have a question from, I believe one of my classmates, um, Madison Poppy says, when did you decide to do a post back? So what, when was that decision point made? Whoever would like to hop on. I, I can go first. Um, I would say that that decision um, didn't come until very late. I didn't solely pursue post uh, We We mentioned this a while ago, but there's plenty of research opportunities outside of post positions. Um, at the same time that I was reaching out um, to different NIH uh, mentors and, and their labs, I was also looking at tech positions. And I was also having an extensive conversation with my mentor um, in undergrad about thinking about just stay, sticking around and uh, continuing to work in his lab, uh, continuing my undergrad work. So honestly, I kind of had those three options going for me at, at all times until and maybe a month before graduation, let's just say like May-ish where I ultimately said, okay, the three have come to an end. I have a few options at the NIH. I have like a one tech position, I think it was, and then I could just stay with my undergrad lab. And I ultimately picked at the very end um, to go to the NIH. So I guess my advice would be um, to not solely bank on post back programs, although I, I, I support them. I think they're really, really great, but there's plenty of other options. And you don't have to decide to go to a post back program right from the get go. You can, you know, have somewhat of a shotgun approach and look into different options and then decide later. That's at least what I did. All right. Thank you so much. And then we also have a question from Mackenzie S., who asks How do you make the most out of a post back research training position in your gap years to prepare for applying for the MD PhD? Um, Molly, I see you nodding your head. Would you like to take this one off? Sure. And I, I think this is something probably everyone is going to have some great perspective to weigh in on. Um, I, I think all of us were nodding because it's a great question. I think the clearer you can be with your goals, the better. And so I went in knowing I wanted to apply for an MD PhD program, knowing that I wanted experience with both clinical and translational research and knowing that I wanted clinical exposure to a wide variety of specialties. And so I was really clear with my mentors, which were my employers as well, about I'm going to take time off. I'm volunteering. I'm doing, I, I want these opportunities. And because I was really clear about interests, they were able to say, here's a seminar, here's a conference, here's a lecture series, here's a course, which opens you up to opportunities you're probably not going to be able to find on your own. So the clearer you can be about this is what I need, this is what I want, this is what I'm looking for, the better. 
And I would say too, the more exposure you can get, the better. Because when you sit in an interview and people ask about your thoughts on medicine and your thoughts on research, that breadth can only help you during the interview process, during the secondary essay process, during the personal statement and writing and thinking process. All right, thank you so much. Um, Nibin or Kelly or Daniel, have a name. I got, yeah, I mean, in terms of making the most out of it, um, I completely agree with Molly. That's all true. I think it, when I think of getting something out of a post back program, going to conferences, doing these kind of things outside of lab to really enrich your story are huge and really, really important. And to add on to it, to kind of uh, give a different perspective, I think something that really benefited me in the interview process was how independent I was in research. Because before that, I was really, you know, I was an undergrad researcher. No shame on that. That's, I love undergrad research. I loved it. It was the most fun I've had in lab. But I was never truly independent. I always had a graduate student above me, a postdoc above me. And something that really was beneficial from the post -back program was be able to go into interviews, present a project and say, no, no one's above me. This is a project that I have, I'm running, I'm buying the reagents for, I'm analyzing all the data. This is something that I have complete control over for better or for worse. And then you are able to talk about it and having ownership of that and showcasing your independence. Some people have already done that. I didn't, but that's, that's really big to get out of the program, at least from a very practical sense of applying and interviewing. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um... Kelly or Nippon, do you have anything to add? Or would you like to move on? <laughs> no. Okay. So how about actually before we move on, um, <clears throat> just as a reminder, uh, this session is going to be recorded. So a team of co-moderators are gathering and uh, submitting questions, which is where I'm pulling from. These questions come from the reg registration link and in real time, the chat box, Twitter and virtual content committee email. So you will um, continue to have access to the FAQ document produced by the MD PhD director panelists. And I believe uh, Daniel, not Daniel Sai, but uh, our Daniel behind the scenes is gonna be helping us and he can put that in the um, regular chat for uh, anyone who's interested. Okay, um, so a question we had regarding more so the application process were, what were your essay topics and why did you choose them? I can, maybe I could frame what the application is from the MD-PhD side a little bit first. Um, so basically, you're writing to three different audiences, and you're speaking to three different audiences. So there's the MD side, why you want to be a physician. And for that, I tend to pull a lot from like my personal history and the work that I'd done and all of the things that like, led me to want to do the job of taking care of cl patients clinically. Then there's the PhD side, there's like, I want to do research, I'm demonstrating the area of research I'm interested in my prior experience with it, um, and pr prior projects. But then there's the MD PhD side, which is like different, distinct from both of them. And so that becomes kind of you describing a little bit of each, but then something completely different about, I see my career going in a direction where I really want to do both and privileging the research. Um, and so that became a discussion of the ways that I thought that my research would, I mean, it's different for everyone. For me, it was the ways I thought my research would enrich my clinical practice and um, for my interests, like my um, desire to be in roles of like public health leadership and and research. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, and not to stray too far off from where we just were, uh, Mackenzie has another awesome question, but Daniel, would you like to add? Yeah, I just, uh, I, I agree with Nubum completely. Just an, another thing to mention, um, uh, so med medical school applications open like around June every year, kind of like mid, like early summer, something like that. Uh, something that I was told very early on my senior year of undergrad that I, I was really glad I was told was to start essentially three essay topics. And that's 
in a very broad sense, I, again, I don't know if this is going to answer the question directly about what topic, but you need to be able to answer on the immediate primary application um, just a personal statement. So anything you want, uh, why do you want the dual degree? And then a huge, just open-ended essay summarizing your research. So answering what topics, I, I know I didn't do that, but those are the three kind of essays, three documents you should be working on from here to June. That's that's what I did. And, you know, starting early always always makes it easier. Then you can just copy and paste into the primary application. No, that, that's awesome advice. Thank you so much for adding to that. Um, so, still, so Mackenzie, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> still riffing on that. Um, oh, no, we, um, and then my pre-health advisor got me in touch with someone doing an MD PhD at a different institution. And very early on before the application process, we were drafting and they were like reviewing that in like real time. And it was like many, many, many iterations of a lot of people looking at it. Like, um, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a cyclical process. Awesome. Thank you guys. So uh, Mackenzie S asks, how do you make or yeah, how do you make slash any tips for the transition from undergrad dependent research to independent postback research? Um, so I know Daniel, you recently had spoken about the that. So if you have anything you could add. Yeah, the, I mean, the transition between, so transitioning between undergrad research to post back research. Um, it's tough. <laughs> Running an independent project on your own is very tough, but I would hope that if you're applying to MD-PhD programs, you probably have a good interest in research and you have the drive to figure it out. So, I mean, I think to aid the transition and understanding that that the first few months of your project and your time might be kind of slow <laughs> and that's fine trying to figure out the nuances of a lab that you know an undergrad people probably did behind the scenes for you and i'm speaking for myself here you know i'm sure you know my the grad students above me bought all my reagents kind of set up the schedule and all that so doing that on your own is going to take some time to figure out but again if you're applying to md phd programs we're all smart we're all really driven to succeed in the lab so you figure it out but i guess having an expectation that it's going to be slow for like two three months is is helpful all right and molly i see your hand is up i think it's worth clarifying that you were not walking in the first day creating your own project you are working with a mentor your mentor has expectations about the work you are going to be doing for them and so you were doing this independent project in addition to the work that the that the lab needs you to do as part of your job or as part of your post back. And so for me, what I did is when I, within sort of the research of the lab, found something that I was specifically excited about or a question that I could bring that had not been asked before, I sort of developed that and then presented it to the mentor to my mentor and said, can I work on this? Can I develop this? And then pulled off and developed that independently. But it came knowing how the lab worked, knowing how the procedures worked, how the data collection worked, and, and all those details. And in addition to still doing what my mentor needed me to do, because they were the person that was paying my salary. Um, Nippon as well, if you'd like to add. Yeah, and I found that a really good mechanism for me to do that, because in social science, it's like, you're your own researcher, like there's not labs. And so doing like a departmental like honors thesis in undergrad really helped out, helped set that up for me. Um, and that was kind of the first time where I was like formally asked to like model those, like the steps of doing a research project. Um, and also like applying for funding or presenting at conferences, all of that kind of forces you to like lay out a plan, even if like, like sometimes you get the funding and you figure out how to make, like do a research project afterwards. And so it kind of gives you a template um, to pull things together. All right, thank you. And then Kelly. I just wanna add that with any period of transition, be nice to yourself. Like there, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to have to ask questions and you're going to have to own up to like, oh, I did this wrong. Like, how can I not do this wrong in the future? Um, even when finding an, in, an independent project within the context of a larger lab or a larger project, 
don't expect for the first thing you suggest to be the winner. I think I suggested like five different projects before my boss and I finally decided on one to go after. So just give yourself some grace and keep on going, keep on making those mistakes and learning. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. That was really great insight from everyone. Um, taking a step back, actually, how did you first get involved with your undergraduate research? And what kind of research did you do? Um, does it relate to how you, what research you're doing now? Or did you find yourself on a path? Did you do undergraduate research, et cetera? Um, so Kelly, I know you just spoke, but would you like to start this one off? Yeah, so I, uh... I'm currently in medical school, so I'm not doing active research right now, but my last research role was um, neuroendocrine and behavior research. Um, and I started out doing genetics and Drosophila in undergrad. So I did not start in a lab that's reminiscent of what I'm doing right now. However, it was a great experience. Um, and what I did is I was interested in my genetics class, I liked the professor. And so I went up to him in office hours and asked if I could work in his lab. And he said yes. Um, and so after doing that, I ended up doing a honors thesis in the psychology department, again, completely unrelated to the research I was doing in his genetics lab. Um, but you just kind of, if something's interesting, go talk to the person and you never know where it will lead you. Awesome. Um, does anyone else want to speak to that point? Daniel? I'll I'll speak to also being in a Drosophila lab. Uh, I love Drosophila research. I think it's really conducive to an undergrad um, lifestyle. I, so I, I my first time in lab, I did a um, internship at the University of Pennsylvania, like a summer internship um, in a in a molecular biology lab. And I pieced together that that while I really liked it, and that's what I want to do going forward. It was very time consuming and it wasn't as conducive to being a student in undergrad, which is the priority is being a student. It, it wasn't as conducive to that lifestyle. So I looked for a topic and a lab where I was able to go to class, come back, do work for like 30 minutes, go to another class, do work for another 30 minutes. And that, at least for me, ended up being Drosophila research. And I also ended up really liking it, learning a lot. A lot of new techniques that in all likelihood I won't learn um, in any rotation or anything like that. So the Drosophila research is, is rare, but I really liked it and I, I recommend it for anyone who's looking for something that works with undergrad lifestyle. Not to say that, you know, everyone's at a different point in their, you know, educational careers and molecular biology. Again, I like it. I think it's conducive to some schedules, but not all. Awesome. Um, Thank you. Um, yes, Nippon. I was, um, I was like double majoring in like chemistry and anthropology. And I was like, so I was in an organic chemistry lab for a while. Um, and then I had been doing some work with engineers at borders, like doing like international kind of like nonprofit projects. And I pulled in one of my anthropology mentors, like after class, I was like, I think you're rad. Could you give me some advice on this project? Um, and so she ended up being involved in the project for a while and then became a mentor for my honors thesis in anthro. Um, and there was like a point in time where I was like, I'm doing two honors theses, chemistry and anthropology, but then like junior year, like midway through, I was like, absolutely not. <laughs> we're going to have to make, uh, we're going to have to triage like what, um, what my research would look like to help push me in the direction that I want. So I went with anthropology in the end. That is awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so back to the application side of your postbacks, um, or in gap years. So were there any gaps you found in your resume, uh, from being like a traditional applicant? And if so, how did you overcome or explain that when you had, um, like through your essays and through your interviews? Um, Molly, if you'd like to yeah, touch Yeah, I was going to jump in. So I would say one thing to be aware of on your application is people look at your timeline. So if you say this is when you graduated and then you don't 
have something filled in, people are going to want to know what happened during that time. So I, you know, I was like, no one cares that I worked at a law school. So I left off the law school thing and people were like, what did you do for two years? And I was like, oh, you do actually need to know um, these pieces because, you know, if you don't tell people what you've done, their imagination fills it in. And if you're an applicant, it will probably not fill it in in a way that is helpful to you. So let people know what your path is, even if it is non-traditional, tangential, and that's fine. And, you know, ideally you're doing research, you're doing clinical. So you're going to be able to talk about those gap years in terms of how it has enriched, improved, uh, really enhanced your application instead of just like, oh, I didn't know how to spend my time. So I, I just didn't apply. Gotcha. Um, would anyone else like to speak on this point? Um, Kelly? Um, I think one of the benefits of taking gap years is that you actually can fill in some of those gaps that are lacking in your uh, application. So if you are lacking a little bit of volunteer experience, you actually have the room to make that up a little bit. If you are lacking some clinical experience, even when you're in the lab, just email a physician at your institution and say, hey, can I come shadow you in the clinic? And that will get you some shadowing hours. So you're no longer lacking that. So I, I think there's a huge benefit in taking gap years because you can tick those boxes that maybe you weren't able to take in undergrad for one reason or the other. Yeah, that's, that's an awesome point. Thank you. Yeah. And to hop in, I think that like, the notion of gaps on the application really depends on what degree program you're applying to. Again, like MD versus MD PhD, like MD PhD committees treat like they really privilege the research in the PhD side. Like the traditional is like 80% research, 20% clinical. I don't want to do that, but that's like what the stereotype is. And so being able to, I think the most important thing is to be mature as an applicant for the PhD program that you're interested in, because they think you're going to be on an accelerated time course for the PhD. So you don't really have that time to like mess around. And that's where like the independent mess around when you're in the PhD program. And that's where like the independent research comes in. Um, and so you actually do have a little more time, but that's like, that's a different story. Um, and then the other thing about publications is that I was very insecure about not having any academic prop publications at the time. Uh, but our Penn, the MD PhD program director, likes to share that most applicants don't, like most people admitted to MD PhD programs don't have publications in their application year, but after their first year, they do, meaning that a lot of the stuff that they did in their gap year gets published on a lag. Um, and so even if you're not, like you shouldn't be insecure if you're like, don't have a publication yet, but I think being on track to like pull projects to be done by the end of the year is really important. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this question is um, considered miscellaneous, but what to do after getting denied from an MSTP program and what the person should do to increase their chances of getting into a program after graduating? Most programs will tell you how to strengthen your application. So reach out to the programs. Uh, even if you didn't receive an interview, you can still follow up and ask either why you didn't receive the interview or if you did interview, why you weren't selected. It's worth knowing specifically what the program wants you to fix. And if that's not an option, I would try to speak with a pre-med advisor who can look at your entire application and be willing to share your entire application. I know a lot of us feel you know, uncertain about parts of it. And we don't want people to know weaknesses, but if you want to get advice on all the different pieces, they need to know if like your science GPA is low or if the, the MCAT needs to happen again. So I would look for, for resources in that way. Yes. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have anything to add? Yeah, I think that's, I totally agree with everything you said, Molly. And like, um, Sometimes it's also like not on you either. Cause I know in anthropology, like some programs only admit every other year. And so I, um, sometimes it can also be like a fit between you and the program. Um, and then maybe it could even be, 
um, maybe the thing that you're saying, um, like you want to get out of an MD-PhD isn't that well supported by what MD-PhD, like MSDP programs do. And then that can create other opportunities for different places, like different types of paths that you can follow. So I think, um, but kind of going back to what Kelly said, like, first off, like, be kind to yourself and like, you've got so much more like life <laughs> beyond like the career. I know it's like, it can be crushing because we put so much of our identity into these like professional goals, but like there is such a wide world and like finding ways to, um, I don't know, maybe like even just take space from it and like take a breather before you apply. It might be great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. And we actually, we have another um, from the Q&A box. Um, an anonymous attendee asks, what do you do or what do you think is the reasonable threshold for lacking a certain experience? I think I've had at least 100 hours of clinical volunteering and 40 hours of shattering. How much did you have when applying? Um, Daniel? Yeah, I think I'm actually a good person to answer this because I had almost those exact same numbers. Uh, as I mentioned, when I was about to apply, um, my my advisor at the time, my undergrad advisor, was saying that my two worst things, my two weakest um, weaknesses were clinical experience and volunteering. And I think on the primary application, I said, so I, I became a CNA. That's where I got my clinical experience from. And before I was a CNA in the same program, I was um, a volunteer companion is what they called it and slightly different roles. But anyway, I had, I think on the primary application, I put like, 50 hours of the volunteering and like 110 120 something like that for clinical experience both of those are low <laughs> and that kind of goes without saying there's plenty of applicants particularly who are pursuing uh, straight mds who have much higher numbers than that but i think this kind of goes back to what was said a little while ago i forget who mentioned it that research kind of has a hierarchy in interviews and truthfully i was i was really worried about it like i i dove into a post back program because i wanted to do research but i was worried that in my interviews it would come up that oh hey you only spent like 100 hours as a cna i actually continued to work as a cna uh during my gap year but that wasn't on paper they didn't know that and but it never came up truthfully <laughs> It, it never came up at all. They were way more interested in my time in the post -bac program, my undergrad research, the transition between the two. And they were interested in, in my time as a CNA, but the number wasn't really an issue because I was able to talk about it very meaningfully. So to answer your question directly, I would say that 100 hours and or like and 50, 100 hours of clinical experience and 50 hours of volunteering is fine if you have meaningful experiences to talk about. That's that's at least my opinion. And then Kelly, if you'd like to add on. Yeah, so these numbers, I guess that they provide the statistics of how many volunteer hours and stuff you should have, they're great to try to match, but it's not a hard and fast rule. You know, you're not going to get rejected just because you are 10 hours short of their preferred number for you. Um, do your best to do the most that you can if you surpass them gold star but often if you have a really substantial volunteer experience and not a ton or even none clinical experience if you can talk about your volunteer experience and still make it seem like you are completely prepared to go into the clinic then that's okay um you it's it's not going to make or break you at the end of the day as long as you can really I guess, balance out the rest of your application and sell yourself on why you're really passionate about this career path. Awesome, thank you. And then Nupin? Ditto everything that's been said. Um, stay off Student Doctor Network and stay off Reddit because that'll just rot your brain. Um, and I think that like a lot of, I, I think the way that application committees use the numbers, like one, it's a shorthand to see if you've done it, like if you've like checked the box, but when you actually get to like the application writing, the essays and the interviews, what's much more important as was mentioned is like, 
have you thought about and reflected on the types of experiences that you had? And can you do that in like a multi-layered way? Like not only like what you saw, like, oh my God, I saw this spectacular thing, but then like thought about what does that mean to you? What does that mean for the profession? What does it mean for how doctors interact with patients? Because I think what um, some of the things that are looked for in that are like, one, do you know what job you're signing up for? Like, do you know what doctors do? Two is like, can you like hang in a clinical setting? So I've just come off of clerkships. And so a lot of that is just like, um, do you know, like just how to behave like in a hospital as a professional, as a doctor? Um, and do you like three is like, do you have like, are you thinking about the kind of leadership you'll have as a physician and the kinds of like commitments that you want to have to like health equity to your patients? And have you, um, have you been able to kind of apply the things you're thinking about the profession to the actual experiences that you've had? That's awesome. Um, I think this is actually going to be our last question as well. I'm not sure if anyone else would like to speak to it um, before I do my closing. I will say really quickly, you have to be able to answer why medicine. And part of clinical experience is being able to answer why medicine. And as an MD, PhD, you're going to come in, they're going to know why research, but if you don't have a why medicine or a why both, you're not going to be a successful applicant. And another question that they ask a lot is, um, why do you need a PhD? So that's, that's also something to consider. And uh, yeah, but... All right. Thank you so much for joining us for our Q&A session. Um, I want to thank our panelists for your time um, and the participants who made this session uh, super engaging. And for so many people, including the APSA Virtual Content Committee, our Justice, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee, our PR Committee, our Partnerships Committee, uh, Gabby, Stefan, and the APSA leadership. And not only do they put these sessions together, but they also work to make the UIM applicants receive word. Uh, we are also currently in the process of planning our calendar for upcoming interactive sessions for this following uh, 2023 year, which sounds crazy saying. Um, so please stay tuned uh, through social media and look out for our emails. And once more, thank you so much panelists. You did an amazing job today. And um, we really appreciate all your insight. All right. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Us.